Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. If you please stand, we'll begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. From the book of the prophet Joel, in those last days, saith the Lord, I will pour my spirit upon all mankind. Your son and daughter shall prophesy. Almighty God, as we gather here tonight, in between the feast of Pentecost and the Trinity, we ask your blessing to guide us, that we may truly, in hearing these words of wisdom tonight, in praying together and being open to your spirits, be more and more able to fulfill your callings, to be witnesses of your kingdom in the world, and one day to arrive in everlasting glory. With the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. James, and all the angels and saints, we offer you these and all of our prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just a couple quick things for you before we begin our program this evening. Um, I want to encourage you, first of all, how many of you brought your Bibles with you tonight? Uh, yeah, well, I said, uh, not so good. For those that brought their Bibles, go ahead and open to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I know the talk title says that uh, we're going to be speaking about the church fathers tonight, but of course, the church fathers are rooted in Scripture. And so we will begin there. And I'll just point out one verse as a, as a way of introducing our speaker this evening. If you look at chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, Acts of the Apostles in New, New Testament, by the way, Catholics. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. You know the story well, and this is the concluding verses of the story of Pentecost and the sending of the Holy Spirit. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. And I'll just point out a couple of things. That these 3,000 people converted, not simply because Jesus rose from the dead, but because the apostles stood up and told people that Jesus rose from the dead. If we want to see conversions in our world today, we have to have the courage that Christ gives us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ in season and out of season. And I know you, you're coming faithfully to the Institute of Catholic Culture, studying the Apostles' teachings, joining in fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers on a regular basis, but we also must preach to those whom we come into contact with, our neighbors, our family members, those that we meet at the grocery store, and so forth. I'll share with you a quotation or a little note that I received in the mail. Dear Deacon Sabatino, I've been listening to the lectures from the Institute of Catholic Culture for a, a few years now. I'm a convert, and coming into the church, it was important for me to have good, solid, and relevant Catholic education. The way the chips fell for me in life, I hadn't a real opportunity to have a formal Catholic education. So when I first discovered your website, I was overjoyed. When he says overjoyed, he's being honest, because when I met this, this brother, I was at a conference in Chicago, and he recognized my face from our videos that he watches, and he walked up to me, and tears welled up in his eyes, and started to tell me what he wrote his note about. He says, the topics covered were always engaging in faith building and presented by faithful believers in the top of their respective fields. I started listening to the lectures on ICC while still in RCIA and living in Seattle. The ministry that you and those who assist you have provided for me is priceless. 
With Augustine, I would mourn, late have I loved thee, and I could not afford the Catholic education that I desired. But the treasures that I have gained from the ICC have helped so much to meet that desire. Without even knowing me, you have helped me to drink for what I have thirsted for, the food for what I hungered for, simply by being faithful to God's plan for you in this mission. And for those donors that are here tonight or watching online, he's not just writing to me, he's writing to you. Because of the ICC, many stumbling blocks to accepting the faith were enthusiastically removed, stones rolled away, and I was helped greatly in being able to articulate the faith on contemporary and historical issues. His letter continues, We are facing, very shortly, at the Institute, the beginning of our fifth year. We have relied upon, for these last four years, the faithful, dedicated, pledged donors who have given monthly to support what we are doing. The ministry that you have provided for me is priceless, and I will work to my dying day to make sure it remains priceless. Not only in the quality of education that you receive, but that those that come to the Institute can do so, like Brother Bonaventure at no charge, to receive what he could not otherwise pay for. Our speaker this evening, Father David McConey, has several degrees, including a master's in systematic theology and a master's in ancient philosophy from Marquette University, a licentiate in sacred theology from the University of Innsbruck in Austria, a doctorate in ecclesiastical history from Oxford. He entered the Jesuit novitiate in the early 1990s and was ordained to the priesthood in 2003. Father McConey has been widely published in scholarly journals and popular publications and is a well-known lecturer on topics ranging from early Judaism to the errors of postmodernism. In other words, he knows everything. <laughs> we, we're delighted to welcome such a distinguished scholar to the Institute of Catholic Culture. Please join me in welcoming Father David McConey. One thing you should know, in December, it was I who called the deacon, and uh, I asked to come talk. He says, no, no, I don't think. You should know that Deacon Sabatino loves you very much, and he would never let anyone up here who would speak to lead you astray. And so I said, please, let me, no, no. I said, he said, look, when there's a Jesuit pope, I'll let you come speak. So <laughs> here we are. No, thank you for having me. It's quite an impressive little... Uh, argument you make for ongoing ed. Not many parishes are blessed to have the kind of resources and energy that obviously uh, Deacon and Melanie and many others must bring here. They asked for a talk on the Holy Spirit tonight, being between Pentecost and Trinity Sunday. So the talk that I have tonight is tracing how we came to understand the Holy Spirit, not only as a distinct divine person, but as consubstantial with the Father and the Son. This was something that wasn't so clear in the early church. How did the Holy Spirit come to be understood as a distinct person? We're going to do this in two parts. The first part of the talk is an historical sketch leading us up through Scripture to St. Augustine, who died in the year 430. I don't know if I was allowed to call on you or not. But, and then the second half of the... No, wait, we, they won't give. <laughs> The second half of the talk will be about the Holy Spirit in our own lives as faithful Christians. I'm also um, under contract to keep it under 60 minutes. So, <laughs> We begin by focusing on the First Council of Constantinople. If you remember, the church has four very early councils that are pivotal. The Council of Nicaea in 325, the Council of Constantinople in 381, 431, Council of Ephesus that declared Mary the mother of God, and then 20 years later the Council of Chalcedon that declared Christ being fully human and fully divine. If you ever get asked about an early church question about where something happened, always say modern-day Turkey. Because everything happened in modern-day Turkey until about 700. All right? We're going to focus first on the Council of Constantinople in 381, but we'll back up to show how earlier theologians thought that the Spirit was a person, and we'll end with the great church father, St. Augustine of Hippo. The second stage, then, we'll look at the three C's. These are my three C's. How the Holy Spirit connects us to persons, how the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, 
and then how the Holy Spirit conforms us to become other Christs on earth. And there is a handout with the longer quotes on it. I find people like to have the quotes to take home. It helps me. You can use it to hide your yawns in a few minutes. God's word opens with the spirit hovering over the primal waters. He first descends personally on Israel's leaders and kings, as in Samuel, and later, of course, on her prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel. And much later on, the spirit is identified as the wisdom of God. Look at Wisdom 7.22. Most often in the Old Testament, this ruach, Hebrew for divine breath, is sent upon particular people for particular tasks. But nowhere in the Old Testament do we read of the Spirit's supreme role that he will have in Christianity, of uniting human persons with God and rendering humanity divine. While the Old Testament makes it clear that there is a Spirit of God, the Old Testament writers do not concern themselves with the relationship between this Spirit and the Godhead. When searching the New Testament, we get more help as most of the passages of the Spirit are fairly generic, but at least they give us a new idea. How? The Spirit inspires the followers of Jesus when they are in need of what to say. Matthew 10, 20. He descends both to acknowledge Christ's sonship as well as affect our own. Mark 1, 10, John 1, Romans 8, which the Holy Spirit is the one who prays Abba, Father, through us. He makes the Christians into temples of God, 1 Corinthians 3. And the Spirit dwells in the baptized, illuminating them and praying through them, 1 Corinthians 2, Romans 8. Treating the Spirit as a distinct divine person arises in those second century apologists. So remember, after the last death, the last death as opposed to the first death, the death of the last apostle in the year 100, namely John, We have these uh, apostolic fathers, like Ignatius of Antioch, and we have seven documents that we call apostolic fathers that go between the year 80 and 120. And then we have the apologists. Apology in Greek literally means to use a word to defend yourself. Logos, apo is the, the prefix for distance. And so the apologists are the ones who are really writing the Roman emperors and the Roman prefects around the province, defending Christianity from their, their abuse and their condemnations. There's a guy named Theophilus of Antioch, who around the one, year 180 is the first to use the word trinity, treia in Greek. He's the first to use that word about 180. And more sophisticated thinkers like Irenaeus of Lyon. Irenaeus was a Greek who traveled to modern-day France and became uh, a bishop of Lyon there. He names the Son and the Spirit the two hands of God in the act of creation. That's a nice image, right? The Father creates with the Spirit and the Son. Irenaeus is the first to imagine the Holy Spirit as the one who unites the church not only on earth, but also acts as the one going before the baptized and defeating other spirits in the world. So the first quote I have from you on your handout is from Irenaeus, this big five-volume work that he wrote around probably 185 or so. We're not quite sure. Irenaeus was martyred probably under Septimus Severus, so anytime between 185 and 202. We're not quite sure, but we know he wrote this before he died. That's always a good thing that (laughs) historians can... Don't remember, I come from St. Louis University, the home of Yogi Berra, and he once said that about, I think, John Wayne. He must have made that movie before he died. (laughs) Irenaeus. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of God, came down upon the Lord, and the Lord in turn gave this Spirit to His church. Imagine that progression, right? The Spirit descends upon the Son at baptism, and the Son gives the church His own Spirit, sending the Advocate from heaven into all the world, into which, according to His words, the devil too had been cast down like lightning. If we are not to be scorched and made unfruitful, we need the dew of God. Think of the second Eucharist prayer now, right? The Holy Spirit falls like, huh? Like the dew fall, yeah, it's ancient. Since we have our accuser, Satan, we need an advocate as well. And so the Lord in his pity for man who had fallen into the hands of brigands, having himself bound up his wounds and left for his care two coins bearing the royal image, that's the parable of the Good Samaritan, obviously, entrusted him to the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? The Holy Spirit's our 
mansion, our temple, our hotel, the place where the good um, Samaritan drops us off. Now, through the Spirit, the image and inscription of the Father and the Son have been given to us. And it is our duty to use the coin committed to our charge and make it yield a rich profit for the Lord. This is an ancient metaphor for holiness that when you and I were created, God imprinted his, his image the way the Roman emperor imprinted his image on a coin or the way George Washington has on our, what was that, quarter? Huh? And so, although no quarters in the basket, just so we're clear. Um, <laughs> right? The God put his identity, his image on us and sin diminishes that. And it's the Holy Spirit who polishes us back to our original image. That's the... Uh, metaphor Irenaeus is using. Let's jump ahead to the year 250. The great Origen. There's a guy named Origen who gets a bad rap, but who's been redeemed a little bit. Christology is very indebted to him. He understood better than most how the Spirit was essential to the inner workings of God. Not only that there was a divine Spirit dwelling in the baptized and ordering creation rightly, but that even within the very being of God, there's a third person real and distinct from the Son and the Father. Who? Second quote. But we, for our part, are convinced that there are three distinct existents, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we do not believe that any of these is unbegotten except the Father. That of all things brought into being through the Word, the Holy Spirit is the most honorable, and He is first in rank of all the things brought into being by the Father through the Christ. You can probably... Here, uh uh-oh, the Spirit brought into being? And perhaps this is the reason why the Spirit is not called the Son of God. The Holy Spirit seems to require the Son as an intermediary in respect of His distinct existence. Not merely enabling Him to exist, but enabling Him to exist as wise, rational, just. And with all the other characteristics He must be thought of as having by participation in the attributes of Christ. So here's Origen. He's probably one of the greatest thinkers we have in the early church. Certainly a a very bright, bright theologian. He imagines that God begets the Son, and from that the Spirit is then brought into being. He understands that where there are, if you will, a lover and a beloved, there must be a love who unites them. There must be a third distinct being. But you can also hear Origen's hesitancy to want to say that this spirit is co-eternal, consubstantial with the Father and the Son. But this is a problem in church history. We can't hold theologians accountable for things the church had not yet defined, right? The church doesn't invent the Trinity. The church comes to understand the Trinity. The Trinity is eternal, right? But it's not until the year 325, 75 years before Origen is writing, that we actually call the Son consubstantial, one in being with the Father, right? And so oftentimes people like Origen are condemned for things that um, I think we should be a little more intellectually charitable with. While Origen has no problem repeating the phrase venerable trinity, he uses that often. While he has the earliest formula of the Trinity as one substance and three hypostases, Origen is the first to use that phrase, one ousia, one substance and three persons. It's in his commentary on John and Matthew. He stumbled often providing an image for how these two were related, substance and person. For example, he often stressed how the Son and Spirit were of a different nature than the Father in order to stress their distinct personage. You can hear the problem with that, right? We Christians believe in only one divine substance. There's only one divine nature, but that divine nature is shared equally and perfectly through three divine persons, but not for origin. But we cannot and should not expect too much precision from a great mind trying to work out the mystery of mysteries before any official church language had yet been defined. For origin is quite clear, and he says this in his big work on first principles, it is impossible to become a partaker of the Father or of the Son without the Holy Spirit. At roughly the same time that Origen writes, another third century African theologian, the first one to write in Latin, a guy named Tertullian, not a saint, a bit of a whack job, quite honestly. But this guy named Tertullian, he's a former lawyer turned Christian. Any of those in here? No, I'm teasing him. Introduced to the church's taxonomy and to the church's vocabulary such terms as trinitas. He's the first Latin to use the word trinitas in about the year 220. 
persona, substantia, all right? Person, substance. He starts using the words that you and I use now. He's the first one. But the problem with these early advancements was that they were all besotted with various sorts of subordinationism. For example, Tertullian famously explained the Trinity as the sun, the rays that come from the sun, and then the points of light contact upon created things. Right? Or he says the Trinity is like the life-bearing root of a tree that gives rise to the branch and then the fruit. Or a spring which flows into a river and then trickles into a stream. You see what he's doing, right? Sun and water and tree are all of one substance. The problem, of course, is the sun is greater than any spot or ray. Hmm? So there's a subordinationism really implicit in almost every work of the Trinity until the late 300s. Father, then Son, then Spirit. And we Christians can't have that, right? It can kind of make sense in our created minds how the Father would maybe overflow into a lesser being, the Son who would overflow into the Spirit. We can't have that, right? What happens? The church is going on, the church is being persecuted, the, the outbreaks of 250, the Emperor Decius is huge. Um, in the year 303, the outbreak of persecutions against the Christians by Diocletian is huge. And then a guy named Constantine finally gets the purple, becomes the emperor. And even though he himself isn't the greatest of all Christians, um, he kills two of his sons, just in case you're wondering. Um, one deserved it, but another did. Um, he's, not, or he's, not constant, he's not baptized till the day before his death. What he does, though, in 313 is allows Christians to be a legal religion in the empire. No more persecutions. Um, we can begin to own land again. You know, one of the first things Constantine did was outlawed uh, branding slaves on the face. You could only brand slaves on the feet and the ankles, henceforth, if you owned them. And that was a Christian reason he gave, is that the image of God resides primarily in the face. A nice thing. He also gave tax discounts to clergy. Another nice thing. But. <laughs> so what happens? Let's move up now to the year 320. A guy named Arius. Arius is a priest in the Diocese of Alexandria in Egypt. He's very popular. People like him. He's got a following. All right. He calls into question the divine substance of the sun. Here's what Arius says. Arius says this, look. What it means to be God is to be uncreated. To be God means you don't have an origin. You don't depend on something else for your existence. And that kind of makes sense, right? You don't want a God who got his job from somebody else. You'll go to that God, right? And so here's the church has a little more breathing room, right? Persecutions are over. Young people can start going to Christian school, so-called. At least young men going to study with their bishops. And language became a little more technical, a little more sophisticated. We also have 200 years of tradition behind us. And so we're starting to talk about the son being begotten. And Arius is like, no, wait a sec. If the son's begotten, he can't be God. He can be a lesser God. He can be an intermediary God. But God himself has to be unbegotten. And so around the year 320, Arius starts to really propound this view and here's his point, that if the Son were equally divine from the Father, God would be divided then into two substances. All right? Furthermore, if what it means to be God is to be without a beginning, how could a God ever be begotten? So Arius concludes there must have been a time when the Son was not. And accordingly, his divinity must be of a lesser sort than the perfect divinity of God the Father. Well, God the Father always knows what he's doing, right? Arius is a middle-aged priest with these great ideas and this rock and roll status around Alexandria. And who pops up? This young deacon named uh, Sabatino. No, Athanasius, that's right. All right. And Athanasius is a young deacon when the emperor Constantine says, look, if these Christians fight and divide more, our unity of our empire will be divided more, so we're going to call them together. And they met at a little town in modern-day Turkey called Nicaea, right? And there at the Council of Nicaea, we hear what? We believe in Jesus Christ. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Begotten, not made. And that's an important phrase we'll get to at the end of the talk. Consubstantial with the Father, or for us older Catholics, one in being. Right? The Greek term there is homo, meaning same, and ousia, that same word that Origen introduced to the Trinity. 
homoousios, same substance, or in Latin, consubstantialis. That was the phrase of Council of Nicaea. But notice what's happening, friends, in the fourth century. The real theological concern is between the equality of the Father and the Son. And that makes sense, right? Because we are what? Christians. So we're trying to wonder, how is this man, Jesus Christ, the son of this carpenter, how is he God? How is he united or related to God the Father? So for the first 325 years, really, our theological energies were going toward the relationship between the Father and the Son. All right? So, in 325, there's no concern to name the Spirit consubstantial or to explore his particular role in salvation history or to define any appropriate task particular to his agency. What is concerned pneumatologically, you know the word pneumatological? Pneuma, spirit, study of the Holy Spirit is pneumatological. It's the simple fact that the Spirit is. That's all Nicaea says. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. Boom, over. What is important to theologians during the 4th century is to defend the Spirit's role in saving mankind. The question begins to arise, then why do we baptize in the name of the Spirit? Do I pray to the Holy Spirit? Should I pray to the Holy Spirit? St. Athanasius, do you know Athanasius was exiled seven times from his diocese? Seven times. Yeah. All right. There's a phrase, Athanasius contra mundum. Athanasius against the world. St. Athanasius sees in the Spirit the one who elevates and transforms us creatures, making it able that we partake or receive God's own life, as promised by St. Peter in his second letter, that become sharers in the divine nature. So to a less learned priest in the Egyptian delta, Athanasius shared the most concentrated reflections on the Holy Spirit, and that's the next quote, his letter to Serapion. Now, Serapion is also a... <laughs> It's also a Greek god whose temple got destroyed a little later, but same name, different people. The Son, let's read that, the Son who is in the Father is not a creature, but of the very substance of the Father. For the same reason, it is not permissible to count the Holy Spirit a creature, and so do violence to the Trinity, since the Holy Spirit is in the Son and has the Son in him. If the Holy Spirit were a creature, we would not have any partaking in God through him. But if by partaking in the Spirit we become sharers in the divine nature, one would be senseless to say that the Holy Spirit belongs to the created nature and not to the uncreated God. You see, what's at stake for Athanasius here is this. The Spirit is the one who elevates us out of our merely human lives. Right? Athanasius coined that phrase that God became man so men could become gods. And it's the Spirit's role that elevates us out of our own biology, our own fallen instincts. Have you ever wanted to lash out, uh, hit your younger brother, show the driver next to you what you think of their driving, right? Have you ever refrained from getting that one mean dig in on your spouse and you don't? Athanasius would say, that's the Holy Spirit. Right then, descended upon you and said, you know what? Biologically, naturally, humanly, you want to bring up last night's dinner to your spouse because you know it's going to hurt her, and you don't, right? You want to give the fellow next to you in the car lane a particular finger, but you don't, right? That's the Holy Spirit right then. He is the one who makes you more than human, and if that's true, if he's the one that makes you more than being a creature, he himself can't be a creature. That's Athanasius' reasoning, that the Holy Spirit has to be God if the Holy Spirit is the one who transforms us, and if I can say divinizes us. All right. Nicaea and Athanasius' victories was the creedal insistence on the term homoousios. But unfortunately, in many ways, things got worse after Nicaea. Nicaea is in the year 325. The church finally has a universal creed. Okay, but Arianism only got stronger. Why? Think of the emperors. The emperors are, for the most part, very greedy men. <coughs> who want to appoint bishops, who want to control the church, who want to tell everyone in the empire what to do. Well, if you're an Arian, it's very convenient because God the Father is greater than God the Son, and of course the bishop represents Jesus Christ on earth. So if you're an emperor, be an Arian, because you can be the Father who appoints the Son and tells him what to do. 
You're not of equal substance. You're of a greater substance. And so in the fourth century, the sons of Constantine were all Arians. And it only got worse with Julian, the pagan, right? Things were bad. In the year 359, St. Jerome wrote, the world has awoken and grown to find itself Arian, all right? From the years that follow Nicaea, however, like any falsehood, any heresy, even Arianism begins to splinter with the various curious result that different groups are now no longer contesting only the divinity of the Son, they're starting to question the divinity of the Holy Spirit. What emerges in the intervening decades of the fourth century are groups who reject the Spirit outright as divine and make Him the highest of all creatures. Some even say the Holy Spirit is the top of all the angels sent as a wisdom figure from God to mortals. Now, collectively, these groups came to be known as Macedonians, they followed a bishop named Macedonius, who was bishop of Constantinople from 342 to 360. They were also called New Matomachians, and I didn't write this on your handout. I should have, because I doubt you use the word New Matomachian very often. Remember, pneuma, spirit. Makoi in Greek is to fight, to contend. So they were known as the spirit fighters, the New Matomachians. All right? They arose in number... In the year 373, one of the leading Pneumatomachians broke from his former friend, a guy named Basil of Caesarea. Do you know Basil? Right? I tell my students, Basil is what we make pesto out of. This is Basil. And he's one of the great Eastern fathers. By 374, these Pneumatomachians are so strong, they receive the attention and condemnation of Pope Damasus. And their position against the Holy Spirit gave impetus to the first theologians who paid the most attention to the Spirit's divinity, the Cappadocian Fathers, all right? Now, these are guys in Cappadocia, which is central modern-day Turkey, and there are three of them. Basil, his brother Gregory of Nyssa, and their socially awkward friend, Gregory Nanzianzen, right, who couldn't stand being a bishop because he didn't like standing in front of people, so he went off to the country and wrote poetry, for which the church is grateful. He didn't have administrative skills. But the Cappadocian formula, as any first-year theology grad student should know, is found for the first time expressed as mia uzia and tre hypostases, one being three persons. This is the definition now by 380 of the Trinity. While this, of course, is eternally true, Gregory Nanzianzen realized that it was a truth that had to be slowly revealed, imparted carefully. And so look at your next quote. The Old Testament preached the Father openly and the Son more obscurely, while the New revealed the Son and hinted at the deity of the Spirit. Now the Spirit dwells in us and reveals himself more clearly to us. For it was not right, while the deity of the Father had, still not be conf had been confessed, to preach the Son openly. And before the deity of the Son had been acknowledged to force us to accept the Holy Spirit. And I speak too boldly here in the bargain. It was much more fitting that by gradual advances, and as David said, by partial ascents, moving forward and increasing in clarity, the light of the Trinity should shine on those who had already been giving light. So you see what Gregory's doing. The Holy Spirit is saved until the church finally could understand the relationship first between the Father and the Son. Okay, God's not broken up, bifurcated. All right, now there's a new spirit, a new person to understand within this community of love, this perfect Godhead. As mentioned earlier, after the outbreak of Arian uh, heresy, Arius, and the radical divisions it brought in the body of Christ, the tension shifted now to the possible consubstantiality of the spirit. By 380, as I said, Pope Damasus in Rome is... is you know who Pope Damasus was? He's the one that hired this young monk named Jerome to translate the scriptures and the liturgy into Latin. Right? In the year 380, the Pope and both emperors in the West, Gratian, and in the East, Theodosius I, jointly decided that a new council of the church was needed, not only in order to address the lingering effects of Arianism, but also to address this problem of who the Holy Spirit was. Do you know the first time a pope ever attended a church council was? Vatican I, 19th century. Before then, the pope never went. He sent his legates. 
So a council is called in May of 381, and it lasted till the end of July, and it happened in the capital of the Eastern Empire, Constantinople. It turned out that in the end, 150 Orthodox faithful bishops remained. 36 Pneumatomachian bishops arrived, ready to deliberate and sway the council toward their position, but they wouldn't sign the Creed of Nicaea in order to get into the door. Wouldn't our churches be smaller if you had to sign the creed before you came in? Right? <laughs> the deliberations were fairly straightforward. 381, 150 bishops. Oh, 30. I thought you thought there were 30 bishops. No, it's 30 minutes. Okay. <laughs> the council opened by ratifying the Trinity first as expressed in the Nicene symbol. Now, this is a great word. You know, the, the word, there's no word for creed in the ancient church. The word is symbol. You know, the Greek word to throw, what do we throw in English? Ballistics. Ballistics, right. (laughs) Ballistics is the study of trajectory. A ball is, right? Balain in Greek is the word to throw. So when you throw two things together, what do you have? Symbol. Symbol. Now, what if I told you, this is the scary part, what if I told you the Greek prefix to scatter was dia? Who's the one that wants to throw your life apart? Diabolo, yeah. The word devil literally means the scatterer, you know? You know what it's like? You're like this way around Deacon Sabatino, and you're like this at home, and you're like this at work. Your life has no unity. It's fragmented. It's divided. We'll talk afterwards. All right? So the first thing the council did is ratify the Nicene symbol. And then seven canons were approved in the next three months. And of these seven, First Council of Constantinople, the most famous is the third canon, which reads, quote, The Bishop of Constantinople shall have the prerogative of honor after the Bishop of Rome, because Constantinople is the new Rome. This line causes great division later between East and West, and here it happened. Now, as the church fathers voted on how to address the divinity of the Holy Spirit, three things arose. First, was Jesus' own mandate to go baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Also was the ancient movement of the priests over the bread and wine, the epiclesis, the calling down of the Holy Spirit. And here we can hear Athanasius, right? If the Holy Spirit can take natural elements and make them supernatural, he himself can't be natural. You can't give divinity unless you're divine, right? And then thirdly, the early church fathers pointed to this feast called Pentecost that was rising up more uniformly around the empire. By the year 381, most places were celebrating Pentecost with great pageantry and expectation. From this new attention to the Holy Spirit, then, we receive an essential addendum to the Nicene Creed, which posterity now refers to as the exposition of the 150 fathers, which is the next quote. Because those 150 bishops present in Constantinople realized that what they were about to attach to the original Nicene symbol could not be considered an addition because you can't add to the creed. It has to be an unfolding of what was implicitly already present. Out of this deliberation came six pneumatological truths. Look at the first one. So remember, the Council of Nicaea, 60 years earlier, just ended with, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, boom, over Constantinople, after 60 years of wrangling whether the Holy Spirit is divine or not, adds these. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord. There's the first one. He's Lord, kurios. He's the life giver, the giver of life. Zuupoion. We get the word zu. Huh? He's from the Father. Right? He's co-adored, huh? who with the Father and the Son is adored, and he is glorified along with the Son and the Father. And finally, he's the one to whom we appropriate, most rightly, God's inspiration of and speaking through the Holy Prophets and the New Testament writers, right? That is, the Holy Spirit is the one who mainly inspires, although, of course, every person in the Trinity never acts alone. And this, of course, is the creed we recite today. After Constantinople I, the next great theologian of the Trinity proves to be the great Bishop of Hippo, St. Augustine. All right, St. Augustine is a city in Florida. Protestants say St. Augustine. We shouldn't, unless there are Protestants here, welcome. But you say the name of the Bishop of Pippo wrongly. Um, 
We're all familiar with his story. Augustine's born in 354 to a pagan father and a Christian mother. Augustine excelled in studies, and he eventually landed a job in Milan as the court orator. This is where the emperor was living in Milan. Rome was too dangerous being too close to the sea. And he became the propaganda maker, the speechwriter for the emperor, but he met his match in Milan. Who was the bishop of Milan? St. Ambrose, yeah. And in Milan, Augustine came across the books of the Platonists. He started to read Plato. He started to read a guy named Plotinus, who was translated by a fellow who himself was the court orator who became Christian years before, a guy named Marius Victorinus, whose own Catholic conversion really inspired Augustine. He was also present, we know, from Ambrose's own calendar to hear Ambrose preach on Genesis and the role of the Holy Spirit in creation. So things came together for Augustine very nicely. In Marius Victorinus, Augustine would have read and perhaps even sung some of his hymns on the Trinity. One hymn of the Trinity offered Augustine a very clear image for the Trinity, which he would develop and rely on. So top of page two, I guess, whatever where the Vatican Holy Spirit is. Look at this Latin hymn, Adesto Sancte Spiritus, Patris et Fili Copula. That's the word I want us to think about, copula. In English, it goes this way, Come Holy Spirit, the copula, which in Latin is a joining, a nexus, a bond of the Father and the Son. When you are at rest, you are the Father. When you proceed from the Father, you are the Son. And when you're binding all into one, you are the Holy Spirit. So imagine what Marius Victorinus around the year 350 has given the church already. This image of the Holy Spirit as nexus, as copula, as joining. All right? This term enabled Western theologians to envision the Holy Spirit as what I call the curvature between the Father and the Son. That you can't speak of the relationship between Father and Son without talking about the Holy Spirit. The phrase that I like is that the Father begets the Son in the Spirit. The Father begets the Son in the Spirit. This is a great advancement over earlier images where you have Father, Son, and Spirit. Because we're creatures and we're finite, we have to think linearly. So the more curvature we can give this mystery of the Trinity, the better. The Father begets the Son in the Spirit. All right? Augustine is the most insistent that we envision the Holy Spirit as the glue. He, in fact, calls the Holy Spirit gluten from Psalm 63. Those of you who are on a gluten-free diet need Pentecost more than anyone. (laughs) The Holy Spirit is the glue between the Father and the Son. The one who is implicitly understood whenever we talk about the begetter and the begotten. Let's look at uh, Augustine's great book on the Trinity, book 5. Here's what he says about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a kind of inexpressible communion or fellowship of Father and Son. And perhaps he's given this name just because the same name can be applied to the Father and the Son. See where he's going with this? He's properly what they are called in common, seeing that both Father and Son are holy, and both Father and Son are spirit. So to signify the communion of them both by a name which applies to them both, the gift of both is called the Holy Spirit. Now again, think of that last word, gift. You can't have a gift without a what? A giver and a receiver. Every name in the West now for the Holy Spirit will be one that always associates itself with two other parties. Right? Augustine says, wherever you see a love, you see a trinity. That wherever there's love, there's always a lover, there's always the beloved, and there's the love who unites them. Right? This is our understanding of the marriage, the sacrament of marriage. Right? What binds two people? Is it love, convenience? Right? What is it? Augustine is the first to talk, though, I think more importantly, about the Trinity in terms of subsistent relations. All right? Did you wonder what a subsistent relation was today at work? (laughs) Think of it this way. How many people are in this room? A hundred. How many humans are in this room? One oh one, really. Um, Yeah, a hundred persons, a hundred humans. How many gods are there? One. How many persons are divine? Three. You see the hitch? Right? You have your own humanity. You have your own autonomy. And as dependent as you are on any one person in your life to make you who you are, 
your spouse maybe, your best friend, a significant teacher. People come in and out of our lives and we remain substantially who we are. People affect us, but not totally, right? My dad died when I was a young boy and I remain, right? But think of the Trinity. What would happen if the Father disappeared? What would happen to the Son? See, the Father has no divinity of his own. If you don't like this talk, you can get, I'm going home. I'm taking my humanity and going home, right? <laughs> the Father's divinity is also whose divinity? The Son and the Spirit. So what defines the Father as Father? Is it what he is? It's who he is. It's relationship, exactly. The Father is 100% upon the Son to be Father. He has no identity in and of himself. His entire personal identity as Father is rooted in two other people. And you see, this, I think, is key to Christian holiness. That we think most of the time of perfection as autonomy, right? The more perfect I become on an instrument, the less I need a tutor. The wealthier I become, the less dependent I am on those around me. As Americans, we usually think of perfection as aloofness, as autonomy. But turn it around. What if the exact opposite is true? When Jesus says, be perfect as my heavenly Father is perfect, maybe he's saying, don't grow in autonomy and aloofness, grow in dependency. Right? I have a stock homily I use at Jesuit high schools, and I tell the boys, I say, who in here says to your mom or dad, I love you? I say, what's harder to say? I love you or I need you? Try that next time you call home, right? Hey, Ma, you know what? I really need you. Oh, what? Right? <laughs> She'll be so worried. Right? But think of that. What it means to be a divine person is to be 100% needy upon another person. The Father has no divinity of his own. The Son has none of his own. The Spirit, none of his own. That perfect love is always communal. And the more you and I grow in community, the more you and I grow on overt reliance upon others, the more we're growing in the divine image and likeness in which we've been made. It stands how we understand perfection on its head. And it's Augustine, in his book on the Trinity, who coins the term subsistent relation. That every relationship in your and my life is an accidental relationship. I had a teacher for a while, she left. I had a friend for a while, he's gone. I, you know, I had a mom and a dad, they're gone. But I remain. My substance is not affected 100% by any relationship, but God's is. That there are three subsistent relationships within the Trinity. I just think that's an amazing, amazing insight. I give you a quote from Father Wynandy, who's right over the river. Um, he's the U.S. Bishop's theologian. I'll save that. You can read that on your own because I want to keep going here. Plus, he's a Franciscan, so thank you. <laughs> So in Augustine's mind, these substantial relationships are precisely what give the Holy Spirit and the Son their unique identity from the Father. Neither Son or Spirit enjoy a separate substance, but only a different relationship. But what does the Holy Spirit do for Augustine? I took this from the last chapter of his work, the great work, The Confessions. It is different for people who see creation through your spirit. He's saying this to the Father. For you are seen through their eyes. No one knows the reality of God except the Spirit of God. How then can we too know the gifts that God has given to us? This is the answer that comes to me. If we know something through His Spirit, it is still true to say that no one knows it except God's own Spirit. For just as it could rightly be said to people who spoke in the Spirit of God, it is not you who are speaking. So too it is rightly said to those who know anything in the Spirit of God. You see, Augustine ends this great life story, the confessions, by saying that when we know eternal things, it's the Spirit within us. When we love, especially with those people we don't maybe naturally like, it's the Spirit who's loving. That the Spirit is the one who elevates us and transforms us into eternal temples. And it's the Holy Spirit, then, is the one who unites us and brings us into greater conformity with Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. St. Augustine defines heaven. He says, in the end, there'll be one Christ loving himself. Isn't that beautiful? There'll be one Christ loving himself. Because that's precisely what love longs to do. And it's Augustine, really, who brought this to the church. That love longs not only to be in union with the other, but to become the other. All right? 
I mean, what does Jesus say? Whatever you do, the least of my brothers and sisters, you do to me, right? That's what love wants to do. Love wants to become you. Love wants to know what it's like to be you, wants to experience your day, your life, your community, your family, your struggles. And it's the Holy Spirit then who does that with us, in us, through us, right? And it's Augustine who has this great, strong understanding of the Spirit uniting us, not only to God, but to one another. That is the Spirit of God that makes the church. Just as any body has one spirit, the body of Christ has a spirit, the Holy Spirit. And so when we look at those first 430 years of pneumatology, what we see in the beginning is this distinct understanding that there is a spirit of God. We then start to understand that this spirit is part of a trinity, but we're not quite sure exactly how to envision this trinity. And like I say, most of the images given to us are subordinating and linear. Father, then Son, then Spirit. In the year 325, the church has the first ecumenical council, the first wide council, where Father and Son are defined as consubstantial. And even there, the great churchmen of the 4th century just simply say the Holy Spirit exists. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. They don't define the Holy Spirit as consubstantial. Don't use that term homoousios with the Spirit. But then what happens from 325 to 380, there's all this infighting within Christianity, within the church. Is the spirit divine? Is the spirit not divine? So the bishop says, the bishop, the emperor, sorry, says, let's call another council. And here we're going to define the Holy Spirit as the Lord, the giver of life, right? He is the one who speaks to the prophets. We're going to add a little bit to the creed to make sure we understand that the spirit is consubstantial. And it's the great Cappadocian fathers, Basil and the two Gregories, that make this really happen. And in the West, then, we get this other strain of the Holy Spirit being emphasized as the glue, the union between the Father and the Son. And I think really the big proponent here to pay attention to is St. Augustine. Now, what I'd like to do is end by looking at what I call the three C's. And I do that just because I think it's clever, which is a fourth C, which I hadn't thought of till that moment. But <laughs> The first thing the Holy Spirit does is connect us. Think of it. The Holy Spirit's job from... All eternity is to unite Father and Son. He is the gift between the giver and the receiver, the love between the lover and the beloved. So it's the Holy Spirit's inherent task to unite persons. As early as 95 or 97 AD, we're not quite sure when Pope Clement wrote this, but Clement of Rome called the Holy Spirit the bond of communion. And again, that's a very Western thing, although Clement certainly came from the East. The bond of communion. Picking up on Jesus' high priestly prayer in the middle Gospels of John, which you have in your Bible, as the indweller and thus the unifier between the Father and the Son. Catholic thinking would settle here that eternally it's the Spirit's role to unite persons. As many parts of a body only come alive and thus together when animated by one Spirit, so too the Church. Comprised of billions of unique individuals, you and I in some way pray together. We think somehow alike, at least on the important things, I hope. We hate the same things, like sin and injustice. Because the church is not a human society, right? You probably are closer to some people that you share the faith with than you are with your own blood brothers and sisters. That we're not merely a coming together of naturally affable and like-minded men and women. The church, on the other hand, is a supernatural body comprised of one spirit, now dwelling in each of us, making us more than human. If you're interested in this, go to the Catechism, paragraph 460, in which the Holy Spirit is the one who makes us into gods. That's the language the Catechism uses. That we're never gods simply by possession. We're gods by participation. We're given God's own life. Haven't you ever noticed that? That you become like the person with whom you spend the most time, right? That's why... You wouldn't let your kids play with certain people on the block, right? You don't want them becoming like those kids. Or, or dog owners, don't you see that? They start looking like their dog after a while. Same haircut, <laughs> same vest, you know. Um, but we become, and that's the Spirit's role. The Spirit unites us with those with whom we spend time. And that's precisely the point of being a Christian, to take on Christ's own life, all right? Paul teaches us that it is due to the Holy Spirit the baptized now become temples on earth. If so, the Spirit now dwells within each of our souls, connecting us not only to God, but to one another. He unites our disparate, our diabolical hearts, our separated hearts, into the unity of God's love. 
I want to take you back to the temptations of Jesus. Who leads Jesus into the desert? No, no, the Holy Spirit leads him. He allows the Holy Spirit to lead him. But when he's out there 40 days, he's away from his support system, he's away from his routine, he's away from his friends, and that's precisely when the fallen angel knows when to attack. The fallen angel will always attack precisely in those places where we feel, does anybody know I'm missing? Does anybody care about me? Does anybody know I'm gone? Does anybody love me? Does anybody care about me? That's precisely when the fallen spirit will attack. And notice what he says to Jesus, if you are the son of God. He attacks precisely at that place where the baptized made us the children of God. None of us in here, if I can say, really believe we're the children of God. None of us really believe that we have been adopted into the same family that even though the DNA between Jesus and ourselves might be different, we're still the children of the same Father. And that's precisely where Satan attacks. And it's the Holy Spirit's role to say, no, you have been connected. You have been made a temple. You have never been alone. Since the day of your baptism, you have never been alone. But it's that illusion of loneliness, that illusion of wondering if anybody cares about us that Satan always exploits. All right? So connection. The second role, the, Holy, the second task the Holy Spirit has is conviction. And I really think this is part of the new evangelization to which John Paul II called us, that we are to be convicted of sin. Now imagine how we start every liturgy, right? I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned. Gotcha, new translation. All right. First, the Spirit convicts us of sin. Now think of what that word means. Jesus uses it. It's in the Gospel of John. It's in Acts. The Spirit convicts us of sin. Convict means to defeat, vincere, to be victorious over. The Holy Spirit never condemns us. That's the evil spirit. If you bring to mind a sin and you feel belittled, mocked, if you feel teased and embarrassed, that's not the good spirit. The evil spirit, remember, he's a fallen angel. He's smarter than you and I will ever be. He knows precisely how to exploit those, those embarrassments, those bruises, those little chinks in our past. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. All right? The evil spirit is the one who tries to divide us from the love of God. For whom does Jesus have the harshest words in Scripture? It's never for the sinner. It's always for the hypocrite, right? Dead man's bones, whitewashed tombs. Now think of that word, hypocrite. Hupo means out from underneath, like hypoglycemic hypnotize, right? Krenomai is the word to speak. Originally, hypocrite was a theatrical term. It was one who spoke out from underneath a mask. The hypocrites think they don't need a savior. They wear a mask of self-sufficiency. They're the ones that Jesus can't, if I can say, stand, right? But in the second century, these odes of Solomon appear. They're written in Syria, probably, around the year 140. And one of them says, this: look into the face of Christ, and see what you look like. The Holy Spirit not only connects us to Christ, he convicts us and says, you know what, You're, you are right. You're not perfect, but you will be. You know what, you have fallen, but you know what, you're forgiven. You know, that's the good spirit. And no greater beauty can be encountered. When you gather your flock for liturgy, this is what we experience. We begin Mass by confessing our sins when we gather as Christ's flock. Isn't that amazing? That the beginning of Christian worship is admitting that we're not perfect? Think of that poor man at John 5 who's been on a mat. He's been on a mat a long time. And Jesus cures him. And what does he say to him? Pick up your mat and walk. It's the last thing this poor guy wants. He's been on it for 30 years. But it's precisely that mat that allows the Jews two verses later to say, hey, wait a sec, who did this to you? It's the Sabbath. You shouldn't be carrying your mat. It's Jesus of Nazareth. And I sometimes think that the Holy Spirit allows us to know our sins and to use them for God's greater glory. That, in fact, most of us would want to say, you know what, that was me, that's over. No, it's not usually the way conversion works. Usually the effects of our sin and the struggles that we have are left with us in order to praise the power of Christ. Or think what he does on Easter morning. He shows the apostles his wounds and they rejoice. Now, I don't know anywhere else in classical literature where wounds elicit joy. They usually elicit uh, revenge or sorrow. 
But there's something about the power of Christ when we show each other, you know, rightly or reasonably our, our wounds. Here's what Jesus has done for me. This is where I used to struggle and now I know a new power. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, I have sinned. Ironically, our sins in the Christian tradition can bring God closer. I mean, face it, those of you with children, when they stumble, don't you love them all the more? Or on your refrigerators, don't you have cards with like backward C's and upside down E's from your grandchildren or your kids? It's the imperfections that draw a truly loving heart closer. We would be cold and, and very undivine if it was only perfection. What? You drew that for me? That's the stupidest unicorn I ever saw. And you rip it up in front of your grandkid's face, you know? There are no unicorns, Billy. Go to school. We don't do that, right? Nor does God the Father. And that's the role of the Holy Spirit. The third role the Holy Spirit does is to conform us to the person of Christ. Okay? The Holy Spirit is the one who claims that, in the words of Basil of Caesarea, the human person is the only animal with the vocation to become God. After the Spirit connects us to God and to his church, after he convicts us and shows us that our sins are still places where God loves us, he then sets to work conforming us to God, making us the mystical body of Christ on earth. Irenaeus, very early on, that same Irenaeus of Leon, wrote, The saints will see God in order to live, becoming immortal by the vision and attaining to their divine lives. But the work of the Spirit is the one who allows us to do more than human things. For example, Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in the Father, Son, and Spirit, in the Holy Catholic Apostolic Church. Those are things that you and I can say, not because we're smart and figured them out. We say them because God gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit and has thereby transformed what we can say and know. And that comes out most clearly, I think, in that very prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father. The Holy Spirit allows us to pray our. Why? Because we're never alone. None of us on the natural level say our, do we? Anyone so pompous here? You're at home. So we would like the butter down on this end of the table, please. Right? You'd get slapped. Right? On the natural level, we say I and mine. But as Christians, we now say our, we. And Father? Our fathers are Gene and you know, Joe and Jack. But on the supernatural level, we have been given the spirit of the same Father. That's why we can pray that prayer. And yes, it's not literally true, but we've been convicted to say what? We will know God as Father fully and perfectly. And that's given to us now in the virtue of hope that the Holy Spirit has poured into our hearts. So we're going to take a little break. Before we do, though, why don't we pray that one prayer as the children of God? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it'll be a time for break and then questions and answers after. Thank you very much, Father. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much, Father, for a wonderful presentation. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. As Father was talking about looking into the face of Christ and seeing ourselves, it just occurred to me during this festal season within the octave of Pentecost, that is exactly what we were made to be to those that see us. That if we can look into the face of Christ and see ourselves, then others ought to be able to look into our face and see Jesus Christ first time at the Institute. I hope not the last time. We'd love to have you come back again and uh, be with us. Free wine. Free, yeah, that, that can't hurt. <laughs> Questions. Now, come on, he's from St. Louis. We ought to really put him to work here. I had heard, I think in another talk, that there was a time when people were baptized just in the name of Jesus. Uh, is that true, or, and why would that be? Yeah, in the early church, you can find baptismal formulas of almost any stripe, right? But the baptismal formula, of all the things we talked about tonight, is quite clear. The end of the Gospels, right? That's how we're to baptize. But there are baptismal formulas only in the name of Jesus. There are baptismal formulas only in the name of the Father. The Arians had their own baptismal formula. So, yes, 
but it was never an accepted practice. It was always some splinter group. Boom. Okay, boom. That was fast. That was good. That was okay. Okay. Yes. Oh, it, was, yeah, it made me go all the way across the room. The room's not that big for those of you at home, by the way. Well, the thanks for coming. Um, Thank you. Since scripture, and especially in, I think it's in John, you know, Jesus refers to the spirit, you know, he will come to you and guide you into all truth. And I don't know the ancient languages, but it seems kind of clear from scripture that the Holy Spirit is another person. Yeah. And that's why I don't, I have a hard time wondering why it took them so long to define that or... That's a, that's a great question. And in fact, I should have said this earlier. It was only when I was talking with one of you uh, during the break. Remember, the people hearing these for the first time are former Jews. And the ancient Jewish primal dictum is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And most theologians argue this is why Jesus Christ didn't come right out fully and say, I am God too, because he didn't want to shock and offend the faith of the Jews, but slowly revealed himself to be divine, as the Holy Spirit then was next revealed, because these people probably couldn't understand it in a way that you and I, who are now living post-Pentecostally, we look at that and say, well, of course there's a spirit. My gosh, look at the pneuma, the, the word pneuma there. It's spiritus, is right there. So, t- for example, when we talk about the spirit of St. James Parish, you know what I mean, right? They got wine and <laughs> wine. and yeah. What makes that a, a person, for example? We talk about the spirit of the Redskins game. Or we use that term a lot, and that was used that way even then. The spirit in terms of an ethos, a feeling, a, a, a meaning, a group dynamic. And so I guess you could read it that way if you didn't have the power of the first 400 years of theology. So I agree with you. We look back and we say, yeah, it's clear, but it wasn't so clear to them. And I think that's why, because being Jews, they were going to hold on to that monotheism that God is one. And to all of a sudden have three overnight, it was like, hmm. All right. What was the Jewish celebration of Pentecost in relation to the Christian celebration? Fifty days after the Passover, there was a feast called the Feast of Weeks. And are you setting me up? Do you know? Because from what I read, it was a feast um, that lasted a week celebrating God's goodness and bounty. Because the way I remember it is this, that it was a feast of celebrating that which comes from below, wheat and whatnot, where the Christian... 50 days later was that which, the, the one who comes from above. But the Jews did have a Feast of Pentecost, but it was more, it was called the Feast of Weeks. And that's, it was a feast of the celebration in the spring. Father, um, do you know about when the difference with the Eastern Orthodox understanding of the Holy Spirit's progression from the Father and Son? Well, when yeah, the, the filioque and the, and the Son, that, that the part that was added in the Creed that was added officially in the 8th century, um, it was as early, though, as the 500s. Exactly what does it mean for the Spirit to come from the Father, as we say in the Constantinopolitan Creed? And so the distinguishment that the Son has a role in this, too, was added. And that, that became a point of division in 1054. But quite honestly, I think if politics would have been different, even the Greeks could understand the way the Westerns do, and we could understand the way they do. It was just so polemically charged nationally that theology got lost. But yeah, by the 500s, that phrase is appearing in North Africa and in Spain. And by the 8th century, it's pretty much universal in the Western church anyway. Yes, Father, I'm not quite clear on your explanation of the Trinity because my question is, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, weren't they always present? In your explanation tonight, it sounded like you're saying that the Father was the beginning, uncreated, Mm -hmm. then the Son, and then the Holy Spirit came later. But weren't they always present? Yes, always and everywhere. If you heard that type of progression, it was more uh, my fault, the way the church came to understand these persons, right? So let's say my crazy Aunt Judy was always my aunt, but my mom only introduced me to her when I was 12 because, you know, the fact that she was my aunt is eternal and constant, but I only came to understand who she was as I got older. And that's the way the church came to understand the Trinity. Of course, Father and Son and Spirit are eternally present, but the church needed time to understand how three and one could coexist. And so it was very clear that the Father was God. It took 
Christians a while to understand that Jesus was also God, not just a great prophet, right? Uh, that he was consubstantial. That's 320 years. And then the Holy Spirit was also. So that didn't change the reality of what we saw, but our expression of it. Does that make sense? Right? Uh, Father, how do you uh, discern the action of the Holy Spirit in your life, or can you take direction from the Holy Spirit, and how do you know? Excellent. You, we better, right? We have to be at the behest of the Holy Spirit. We have been made um, temples of him. How do we know it's the Holy Spirit, not just our own natural desires, or even worse, the uh, enemy? Usually two ways, right? Prayer and community. But I mean, prayer is, I have the sense that I should do this. Well, when I go and think about it, does it bring me integrity, creativity, is it in accord with the church's teaching? Do I feel more alive when I think about doing this? And so we don't fool ourselves, which we all can do easily. You bring it to your spouse, your best friend, your confessor, to Deacon Sabatino. He has a lot of free time. Um, <laughs> you talk to someone about it and get their feedback. That's traditionally, going back to the Desert Fathers, prayer and, and community are the way you do it. The Desert Fathers, of course, had a spiritual father. They could, But we have those, too, in our friends and family. So that's... That's a very important question because the more we grow in holiness, the more we would do want to abandon ourselves to the Spirit, right? As Deacon says, you want to go up to someone in the store and say, hey, have you thought about Jesus? Or you? I mean, the more you know Jesus, the more you'll want to do that. And so you have to, and it's like any relationship. The more you spend time with that person, you come to trust them. You sense their voice. You know who they are. So thank you. That's a good question. When I was growing up, we blessed ourselves in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. When was this changed and why? And thank goodness it was changed. <laughs> That's good. Well, ghost just comes from the old English geist, which is the word for spirit in German today. So, I mean, you could use Holy Ghost, but I think it was a leftover when English was still a little more proper and still rooted in its Germanic beginnings. And when did we change? But you mean, you mean at Mass in the vernacular? It was the Holy, it was the Holy Ghost. Well, I, was, I was born in the late 60s. I can't answer that. I don't know. <laughs> I thought you meant at home or something. Does anybody still use Holy Ghost? Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Do you? Okay. Still God, just scarier. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Father David. Thank right. you. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.